In this section, we're going to learn a new method of integration. But really, it's not going to be a new method at all. It's going to be a familiar method, u substitution, with a specific pattern that we'll observe over and over again. So I've titled this trigonometric integrals with u substitution. And this method that we're going to talk about will apply to two types of problems. One where we have powers of sine and cosine and another where we have powers of secant and tangent multiplied together. So those two types of problems specifically, we're going to observe several cases. And in each case, we're simply going to do u substitution. But by observing several examples of the same form, we can find a pattern that will help us pick the u substitution carefully and easily. There's an extra step to these problems, which will involve some substitution with trigonometric identities. That's why this is set off as kind of its own section. Even though it's really just u substitution, there's an extra step in the middle of using trig identities to substitute in such a way that the u substitution works. And we'll see exactly how that works as we do examples. So in the first type of problem, where we have powers of sine and cosine multiplied together, something like sine squared of x times cosine cubed of x, for instance. In that case, we'll pick a substitution where u equals sine of x or cosine of x, one of those two. And in the other case, with powers of secant and tangent, of course, u might equal secant of x or it might equal tangent of x. And as we see a few examples and talk about the general process, it's going to turn out that we can pick which one to do at the very beginning. So we can select our u substitution very early in the process by paying attention to those powers of sine and cosine or secant and tangent and we'll pick the right u that will make the process as smooth as possible. So really what we're doing here is taking advantage of trig identities using u substitution which we're already familiar with and then noticing some patterns that will help us get to the right process as quickly as possible without going down a lot of blind alleys and trying different substitutions that don't work. So that's our approach here. And before we can get into it, we do need to review some trig identities because we'll be using them. So I have a few written down here. The first identity is the most familiar one and the one that you should certainly remember from your trig class. If you've forgotten everything else, you should remember this Pythagorean identity that sine squared of x plus cosine squared of x equals 1. A lot is built off of that one. It's sort of the fundamental piece that builds the unit circle and there are a bunch of other applications of it. But that we'll use whenever we are working on an integral of the first type with powers of sine and cosine where we need to make a substitution we can use this Pythagorean identity to replace powers of cosine with powers of sine or vice versa. Now, notice here that we have sine squared and cosine squared. So thinking ahead, we'll need to look for maybe even powers of sine or even powers of cosine. We'll get to all of that in due time, but you can start thinking about that even now. From that identity, we can derive another related one. If you take the Pythagorean identity and divide every term by cosine squared of x, you get this related version where you have tan squared of x plus 1 equals secant squared of x. And that one will be useful whenever we're doing an integral of the second type. There will be times that we'll need to substitute powers of secant or powers of tangent for the other one. So there's a lot of rewriting one type of trig function in terms of its pair, sine and cosine or secant and tangent and then there's a u substitution process. There are a couple more that relate sine and cosine, these half angle identities. These are less familiar perhaps, but they're good to have in front of you if you've forgotten them. And once you use them a few times, it's pretty easy to remember them. Sine squared of x equals 1 half times 1 minus cosine of 2x. And cosine squared is the same thing except with a plus instead of a minus. So in both cases, you have the cosine of 2x. The only difference is this plus and minus. 
So those will be useful to us as well, and we'll talk about when to take advantage of those. And then lastly, I have here a reminder of the derivatives for sine, cosine, tangent, and secant. These should be relatively familiar from your Calc 1 class, and we reviewed them also when we were reviewing basic integrals at the beginning of this course. But you should remember, of course, that the derivative of sine is cosine, the derivative of cosine is negative sine, the derivative of tangent is secant squared, and the derivative of secant is secant tangent. So with all of that, we're ready to do some problems, and we'll use these identities as they become useful. So for the first example, we won't need to use any identities. It'll be a relatively straightforward use substitution problem, but it will illustrate some of the, at least starting point for these types of problems. So for our first example, we'll take the integral of sine of x times cosine of x. And this, of course, is one of the first type where both powers are one. I wrote down earlier sine to the m of x and cosine to the n of x. In this case, m and n are both one. It turns out, if you think about this carefully, and you can pause and see if you can figure out what the u substitution should be, but if you look carefully at it, you should be able to see that we can actually pick u to either be sine of x or cosine of x. Let me show you what I mean. So first I'll do it with u equals sine of x. And if you remember back to u substitution, there was a variety of approaches that we could use to pick our substitution u, but one of them was to look for part of the problem that looked like the derivative of another part. And cosine certainly looks like the derivative of sine of x. Now it turns out sine of x also looks like the derivative of cosine with the addition of a negative sign, but we'll leave that for now. So we can select either one. If we select u equals sine of x, then du equals the cosine of x dx. And our substitution is very simple. We just have u du, which when we integrate it becomes one half u squared plus c and we can replace u with sine of x. So we have one half sine squared of x plus c. Now on the other hand, if we selected u to equal cosine of x, it works much the same way. In this case, du equals the negative sine of x dx. So if we're looking for the sine of x that we can replace, we would move the negative sign over by dividing, just like we would do with a constant back in those early problems. So we have negative du equals sine of x dx, which means when we make our substitution, cosine of x gets replaced with u, and sine of x dx gets replaced with negative du. So we have the answer negative one-half u squared plus c, or negative one-half cosine squared of x plus c. Now right away, you may look at this and have a problem. Because you might say, how can we work the same problem two different ways, both of which should be correct, and yet we get two different answers? And again, you might want to pause here and see if you can figure out what happened. It turns out that both answers are correct. In fact, it turns out that both answers are equal. And if you think about this, the only difference between sine squared and cosine squared is a constant. If you look at the Pythagorean identity, sine squared of x plus cosine squared of x equals 1. So we could rewrite that as one minus cosine squared, for instance, equals sine squared. So if you take this first answer and replace sine squared with one minus cosine squared, you'll get one half minus one half cosine squared of x 
plus C. And notice that this one half is a constant. This plus C is an arbitrary constant that could be anything. So really you can fold that one half into the plus C. And this is the same as negative one half cosine squared of X plus C, which is what we have on the right side. So that's a little quirk with these problems that because of this Pythagorean identity, and it turns out the same thing happens with secant and tangent in some examples, you can work the same problem two different ways and get what looks like two different answers. But really, because of those identities, it turns out those answers are equivalent, and the only difference between the way they look is a constant, which can be folded into the arbitrary constant plus C. That's what happened here, and that's what happens in a few of these similar to this. So there are some problems that you'll run across where you can immediately start a U substitution just like this. For instance, if we change the problem slightly to the integral of sine squared of x, cosine of x. Again, we now want to pick U to be either sine of x or cosine of x. Now in this case it's a little bit clearer because we really only have one choice. If we picked u to be cosine of x, du would involve sine of x, but there would be an extra sine of x that would not be handled by the substitution. So when you're doing your substitution, you need to make sure you take care of all of the x's. And if we let u equal cosine of x, that would be taken care of by u. One of the signs would be taken care of by du, but there would be an extra sign that's hanging around without anything to substitute for it. So this tells us that we should let u equal sine of x. So then we'll have this turn into u squared and then cosine of x will get picked up by the du. Now we're gonna work this one out in detail in just a second, but I'll pause here and point out that as you're thinking ahead, we need to have a single cosine to serve as du in this case, or in a similar problem, we might look for a single sine of x to serve as du. So you can start thinking about that, and in a minute, once we've done a few other examples, we'll write down a general procedure for this. But start thinking ahead to the fact that we need a single sine or cosine by itself to serve as du, and then the other function will be our u. So in this case, we have a single cosine of x by itself, which tells us that sine being u will work for us. So let's try that. Let's let u equal the sine of x, which means du equals the cosine of x times dx. And then we can substitute very quickly and get u squared du. And when we integrate that, that becomes one third u to the third plus c. And we can substitute back sine of x for u. So we get one third sine cubed of x plus c. So we'll do several more examples before we write down a general process, but what we're noticing already is that there's this lone single power of cosine or sine. In this case, it's cosine. And that's the one that we set aside to serve as du. And once we do, we recognize that u has to be sine of x in order for du to be cosine of x. So keep that in mind as we go through a couple more examples in the next video.